Hello, and welcome to Answer Everywhere, a show where every episode we take a look at a new unfamiliar code base and try to see what makes it tick, or at least what's interesting about it and what we can figure out as developers and scientists and humans and apes. So today we're taking a look at Flux CD. This is the second in um, a sequence of three episodes where we're looking at Kubernetes-based uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery systems. If you're not familiar with continuous uh, delivery or continuous integration, um, the basics are for continuous delivery, what we're trying to do is uh, regularly build artifacts like binaries from our source code and make sure that they make them out to where make, they, they go out to where they need to go to. So if you're running on something like cloud, you might have a bunch of VMs that are running containers and you want to make sure that those containers are up to date. And you also want to know at any given time, you know, what percentage of which VMs are running, which version of the binary and so on and so forth. And that's the, uh, that's the sort of thing a CD system is doing. CI is more or less synonymous with continuous uh, testing. So as we're developing a code base, we want to make sure that we regularly regularly run tests. Um, and when we attempt to submit something like a pull request, we want to make sure that the tests pass on the pull request before uh, merging and so on and so forth. So these are related tools. They both involve a lot of automation and workflows but the, um, they're different enough that the projects tend to specialize in one or the other. For example, Jenkins is a well-known open source CI tool that you wouldn't really use, I don't think, for continuous delivery, although maybe somebody does. And we looked at Argo CD yesterday, which is a Kubernetes-based um, CD tool. And then we also looked at Argo workflows and Workflows tries to do some of the CI stuff as well. And now we're looking at Flux. I think Flux is, is mainly a uh, continuous delivery CD tool, um, but I think it also, people, I think also people use it for CI. Uh, I'm not sure. So we'll take a look at it. Like Argo, um, the Flux project is laid out by having a, a billion Git repos, and they all seem to be interconnected. So for example, um, Flux2 seems to be the main entry point for the open and extensible continuous delivery solution for Kubernetes. Um, but Flux2 is going to pull in things like Helm controller, source controller, etc. I'm not quite sure why these projects are laid out in this fashion. There might be some combination of wanting to make sure that things like issues are filed with the appropriate project and may have something to do with the fact that they're Git ops, so they think of Git as a as a, a Git repo as a deployment unit, in addition to being a source control unit. Personally, I find it a little bit confusing because all of these projects are obviously closely related, but there's no single source control repo that that tracks the development across these projects. We've sort of sliced up a bunch of things that maybe because they want to be deployed separately, but really they should be tracked that their development should be tracked separately. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I'm going to go, I think, straight into Emacs as opposed to looking at GitHub. So I've e Emacs open here. I've got I've cloned a few of the Flux repositories. I'm not sure how many of these I need, but I have some of the controllers, for example, and I have Flux 2. Now, what I don't have yet is a sense of where, where the good code really is. One thing that we can do, I suppose, is pull up um, just a visual indicator of where stuff is in the code base. So obviously there's lots of stuff in the Git directory. And in this case, there seems to be a lot of stuff in the command directory. I, I believe in Go, command is conventionally a, a directory that contains essentially uh, like command line tooling, kind of the command line interface to all of the uh, application logic. Package... I forget exactly what people do with, with package and go bootstrap. This seems kind of non, um, non essential, I would argue. So maybe I can ignore package internal has things like flags 
I don't know if these are like command line flags or maybe feature flags, build stuff, utilities and tree. What is a tree? Maybe I'll look at tree. That's presumably just an implementation of a tree. RFCs, I guess these are proposals. And install and actions. Action just has a YAML. And then we're down, down to the bottom. So I'm really not sure what is in here. Um, so I'll take a look at manifests, but I think as we'll see manifests quickly starts calling out the things from other, um, other repositories. So let's check out manifests here. We have things that seem like they might be interesting, like bases, CRDs bases. I'm going to, to assume is, um, like the base template sort of thing of, a uh, of Kubernetes config. CRD should be custom resources. Um, we also have install integrations, monitoring, and I'm not sure what, so CRDs seems like the most obvious thing to look at, but if we go to the customization, we see that it's just grabbing a bunch of things from different GitHub repos, like the source controller, the Helm, the Helm controller, notification controller, et cetera. Some image stuff. Integrations, we have some, I guess these look like they're, um, integrations with other thingamajigs like Azure, I'm guessing is Azure cloud. We have base, whatever base is, um, more Azure stuff. And then I'm not sure what event hub is. Let's look up event hub. I'm guessing event hub means this stuff, a fully managed P A A S. So it's a platform of a, as a service that has something like it's got like Kafka stuff. I don't know, maybe some, um, event broker stuff that somehow managed as a service. And what else monitoring is using Loki and Prometheus. All of that's fine. We have different policies to find, like to allow egress. And I guess you can, I guess the idea is you can import these if you want to use customize to add these policies. So customize is, um, an overlay approach to writing all of your Kubernetes YAML stuff. So Kubernetes is the, the game is all about YAML. It's YAML 100% of the time in Kubernetes land. And there are a few ways of doing this. One is templating. So Helm is a big player on the YAML templating for Kubernetes, uh, business. Um, but, but customizes another approach that tries to be a little bit less chaotic and unpredictable than, than templating. Um, and so I'm just kind of noticing that these seem to be little snippets of YAML files that we can stitch together and make things. But what I don't know is like, is there, um, is there code? So maybe let's do take a look at command because maybe everything is in command. So in command, we have lots of go files, including alerts, bootstrap, build artifact, build, build customization, check, complete, create a bunch of stuff, including customizations, image updates, Helm resources. So maybe this is where, where all the stuff is. We can delete diff export. We can get image and all of the stuff. Resume, suspend. Yeah. So I'm going to guess this is where stuff is. Let's look at tree.go. And go please is uh, complaining and thinking and thinking for a long time. And uh, Cobra is a, uh, if I remember correctly, Cobra is a go command line tool builder thing. And so I think it's just registering this command, which is tree, and it's going to print the resources reconciled by flux. And it's just adding tree command. What is it going to call? I'm not sure. So somewhere there must be a thing that calls tree command, right? Let's take a look at tree customization. There's this tree uh, KS command. 
the tree ks flag and when we initialize we'll do some stuff with the flags and then we've got this tree ks command run which is gonna i guess take the cobra command i guess this is like the implementation and uh we're going to use cube client to do some stuff with some config args And I guess we're basically delegating everything out to cube client. And now we have this tree thing. Let's figure out where tree really comes from. Internal tree. Here we go. Here's like the internal tree. A new line. <laughs> this is the slash n character. And then we have this thing. It kind of looks like an ASCII T if you look over multiple lines. Or these are just independent strings, I guess. All right. And so we've got a struct um, called object metadata tree which has a resource and a resource tree. And I guess this is like the subtree, the, the children were like in, in an adjacency list, except, sorry, this is exported. This is big O object metadata tree, and this is little O object metadata tree. So the big O is the exported one because we were in go and capital letter, <laughs> capital beginning of the capital letter means it's exported. And so what can we do with it? We can add, I guess a tree to another tree. Oh, no, we can add, sorry, we can add metadata to the tree. We can also add a tree. We can, I assume, get the items and maybe set them. And we have some text and print. All right. And this is just some tree. So what is add tree going to do? It's going to take the resource tree and append it and append to it on what node, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the underlying, I guess everything is a list, right? So we're just appending to the list that, that, um, that makes the tree. Okay. So that's tree. Why do we need it? I don't know. Let's take a look at other things and see if they have interesting implementations. I guess let's look at pool. I believe that flux is a pool based get ops system, which means that as the uh, containers are running on your Kubernetes cluster. Instead of um, instead of you pushing to some flux thing to cause it to start kicking off a workflow, uh, flux is going to repeatedly pull whatever's hosting your Git stuff. I'm not sure I entirely understand the the the, the trade offs of the the pool slash polling approach, but um, I guess if most people are using something like GitHub. Uh, then a, it's not, they, they have uh, GitHub as a massive service. So um, it's nice if you're, if a massive service isn't pushing to a smaller service, because that might cause like some sort of overwhelming badness. Um, it's easier to, to pull from it. And there, there may be some stuff about security implications because you have to, um, you don't have to have a service listening to push to and whatnot. I'm not sure. Um, but here we just get the pool, the pool command and the add root command, pool command. So let's look up Cobra. I'm not sure I understand. Um, this is defining a thing that has a use, a short and a long. So those are you, these are like user basing stuff, but I don't think I understand how uh, how this implementation works. Like where is pool command really implemented? Easy subcommand based clause. So commands represent actions, args are things and flags are modifiers of those actions. Um, so maybe flags, we saw flags in one of the files. I'm guessing flags is maybe the Cobra flags because this seems to be a heavily Cobra Cobra dub app. Maybe let's try find references. We're going to pull artifact. You're going to add stuff, I guess, to the pool command. So maybe it starts with nothing and then we're going to populate it somehow with commands. Let's look up Cobra add command or maybe we see its implementation file is right protected is it
Okay, so add command has one or more parents, one or more commands to the parent command. Do we get source code link? I think we do, right? Somewhere. Is this it? Oh, I think I scrolled away from it. Okay. So whatever, so, okay, we have some command and we have some command C and we're passing in a, uh, I guess, like variable amount of commands. We're going to range over them and make sure we can add them. And then we're going to say commands at I, for all of these commands at I, their parent is C. So, okay, I guess commands have parents, they form some sort of tree. So I'm not, I'm guessing that um, this somehow is is a way for the Cobra to figure out what the implementation of a command is. Maybe I can look for implementation. I don't know. The structure of commands, arguments, and flags. Commands represent actions. Yeah, yeah, I think I read that. A command is a central point of the application. Each interaction that the application supports will be contained in a command. More about cobra.command. Okay. Uh, use, et cetera, et cetera. Long example. Args, arg aliases, deprecated version. All right, whatever. So somewhere, somewhere we should get implementations of what it means to do these various commands, but they may not be the same like symbol which is fine. So in this case, uh, we've got this pool artifact command. So let's look at pool artifact command. It's a Cobra command. And when it's run, it, we're going to call this pool artifact command run. And what is this going to do? It's going to, it should pool some artifact. Artifact I'm guessing is going to be like a build artifact. Why would you need to pull it? I don't know. So we're going to parse the artifact. We're getting some OCI thing. Where did OCI URL? I guess we're going to, uh, the first, we, we pass in an OCI URL. And then we look at the provider of the pool artifact args. And we, if it's generic provider, and the credentials, I guess, are not the empty string, then we will try, I guess, to log in with credentials, um, et cetera. And assuming that works, we will try, um, I guess we might also, okay, so if we're done here, um, then I guess we are, we're not the generic OCI provider. And so we try to log into something, whatever the, the provider is. Uh, and then we try to pull the artifact from wherever we're trying to pull from. And we call OCI client pool and determine whether there's a success. So OCI client pool, I'm assuming this is just some interface file is right protected. Have I done something to Emacs to make it right protected? Oh, no. Um, and so I'm not sure what OCI stands for. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure? Is that how they're using it? Let's see what it, OCI repositories. For an OCI repository. It creates a tar a tarball. OCI. Huh. I'm not sure that I know what this is. Maybe it is really just OCI. Open, okay, open, <laughs> open container initiative. That makes sense, yes, okay. I am familiar with open container initiative. I guess Oracle is uh, competing with that name now. Okay, so we're gonna so what is some open container initiative compliant thingamajig? So basically like a I guess like a Docker registry as that is what it's gonna pull. And it makes sense that it needs to pull that stuff. So what about push? 
push.go. Again, we have, we're going to add the command push command, but um, there must be a real implementation somewhere. And as far as I can tell, this is the only implementation push artifact command. And this is going to be the implementation just based on their naming of the other one. We're just going to, we're just going to add run, I guess, to the end. And uh, it's going to push some artifacts, maybe uh, containers, maybe something else. We get some client metadata, like where we're, <laughs> where we're going to push it, what re which revision it is, and some annotations. And we'll need to authenticate. The client might not be supported. We'll try to, um, I guess, get the OCI provider authenticated, et cetera. We may need to log in with a login new manager. And then may, if, I guess, if we're not timed out, we'll set back off and somehow try to authorize calling auth n default keychain resolve from the context. And then we'll retry transport and do what? Uh, we'll append to the options something about retrying with back off. So we're somehow setting setting back off policy or whatever it looks like. And then we're getting a new client. What kind of client? I don't know. Probably some sort of REST client. And then we're going to push and get a, uh, a digest URL as a result. I guess if we're pushing something like a container, I think maybe the thing we get back is the, um, is the digest of the container, which is it's the, 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 the unique way to refer to it. Um, and then we'll reg the new digest, I guess, register it, whatever reg is, maybe we'll come back to reg. We'll reg a new tag with the URL. And then we're going to make this struct that has just information, I guess, about the container. This all seems to be container stuff. Okay, so let's find out, let's find out what reg is. I'm just curious what you need to register. Whoops, did I do that? Okay, so it's a container registry thing and they're using some other Go package to handle that. Okay, so that is artifacts. Let's look at reconcile.go. Is this reconciler might be the, the most important thing. So a reconcile command is a thing that has an API type and a reconcilable object. And the interface has an adapter to be able to load from the cluster, copyable to be able to calculate patches and suspendable to tell if it's suspended. All right. I'm not sure. I guess an adapter is a thing that maybe has the tooling that you need to load from the cluster, like a client of some sort. Um, and then we have some methods like get and set annotations. And last handled reconcile request and successful message, which is what do you want to tell people when successfully reconciled? And then we have reconcilable conditions, which takes a reconcilable and returns a list of conditions. Okay. And what are we going to do? We're going to, uh, I think that this is, this syntax is like casting the object that we passed in to a meta object with conditions. And, um, if that works, then we have this, this is the, the, then this function is well-defined and we'll call it and we'll return its value. Otherwise we'll try to cast it, I guess, to old conditions. And we'll call get status conditions on it. Old conditions, I guess, is probably some previous implementation that they no longer stand behind. Let's take, see if we can see what old conditions is. A deprecated API, which is sunsetting. All right. Okay. And then is ready. It's just going to check if stuff is ready. Build component object refs. And that's it. So what, but like, what have we really reconciled? I guess to reconcile in this case is, is, Maybe relatively straightforward. Uh, well, let's look at is ready. We're going to pass in a bunch of stuff like a, 
a a context, a cube client, the name of a namespace, and it's something that's statusable. And we're gonna wait. Wait dot condition func. I'm not sure what this syntax means, um, but I'm gonna assume it's some sort of waiting or a locking condition, I guess. And then we're gonna return a a function. We're returning a function that's gonna take no arguments, basically. Uh, I guess like a lambda, it's going to return a boolean and an error. And then the queue client, so when you call this function that you get returned, the queue client is going to cast the object as a client object and attempt to get it. And then we'll try to confirm the state we are observing is for the current generation. And so if the, if the intended state, which is uh, the, I guess get generation is different from the observed generation. We're going to return false with no error. All right. So this is not going to try to reconcile everything. Anything, I guess, is just going to wait. Otherwise, we're going to just do some basic testing. Um, and if the condition is true, we'll return true with no error. If this condition is false, we'll turn, return false with some error that we got from calling some, I guess, Kubernetes API thing, right? And then otherwise we'll return false with no error if we kind of fall through. And I guess it's somebody else's job to, to do the actual reconciling because I don't see where we reconcile anything. What about source? What is source going to do? General purpose adapters for attaching methods to, for the various commands. So we have this like, OCI repository stuff, a bucket adapter for what is a bucket? Maybe like Bitbucket. Man, Go Alice, Go please is extremely slow. I don't know if it's my machine or if it's just life with Go please. Okay. Um, all right. So bucket is, where are we? Something. The flux authors. Is this Bitbucket? Generic bucket provider. So what does a bucket do? We have an Amazon bucket, Google bucket. Okay. So, so this is like cloud storage. Um, uh, things like... <laughs> I forget, I'm blanking on the name. They, I, they were just on screen. You can rewind the video and pause. But basically, um, cloud storage buckets. All right, so I'm getting a sense of how this is all implemented. I guess let's take a quick look at events. And events command run. Again, we're, we're using queue client, getting some options, etc. Show namespace, get rows. What are we getting rows of? Events, event args watch. So we're, I guess we're going to try to watch something in the cube space. What is get rows? Get rows is going to take a queue client and stuff and add a bunch of events, I guess, and try to and try to watch them and print out some nice rows is what I'm guessing. All right. So all of this is, I think, relatively straightforward. I don't see anything that's um, that's really complicated or um, it's kind of right, right now. It kind of all feels like glue around. Kubernetes and containers and stuff. I think I mentioned in the Argo CD video that some projects in this space are kind of like the their their design seems like the thing you would have together if you had a few hours um, and you needed to build some sort of um, CD system. So this is starting to really look like that. Uh, so far, what have we seen? Well, it can pool images, I guess, which it needs to do if you're going to like build stuff. It can push images, and by images I mean like like Docker images or, or OCI images. It can reconcile some stuff, uh, which it does by essentially delegating to Kubernetes via the queue client. And uh, I don't did we look at build? At some point, it's got to build some stuff. Which what I would like to see is it's going to launch some um, some workers to do that, but maybe it will just do it on wherever it is. And it's, I don't know, is it going to run just a general shell script? Is it going to call a Docker 
build or some OCI equivalent. I don't know. So let's take a look at build, build command run. Or uh, so we're just calling OCI a new client and then OCI client build. So we're just calling the OCI client to build stuff. Build archives, the given directory as a tarball in the given local path. So it seems like we're doing this locally. Is there anything that contradicts that? What is create going to do? Let's look at the Cobra. Create or update sources and resources. All right. Create tenant, create source helm, create source go. Create or update sources. I, yeah, I don't see anything that's going to um, launch a worker. Suspend, but maybe there is. Okay, and so that's command. Uh, let's take a look at action. We just have action.yaml, blue, color blue. For installing the Flux CI. So this is something for installing the Flux CLI. So I'm going to assume that we've already had it installed. Docs, <laughs> I'll ignore as usual. Manifests we've looked at. Packages, we have bootstrap status and uninstall. I guess that's not so interesting. RFCs, uh, authorization. How Flux determines which operations are allowed to proceed. This interacts with the Kubernetes action uh, access control. Okay, so that's some description of authorization, et cetera, et cetera tests. Okay. So it doesn't seem like there's a lot there. Um, and so that's really simple. That's probably good. Uh, but let's take a look at the one of these controllers that I downloaded, maybe source controller. Hack is what? I don't know. Internal package. Let's look at GCP, gcp.go. Are you going to open? Okay. We have a client for the GC, GCS client is a minimal Google cloud storage client for fetching objects. Okay. So we've got some client to fetch stuff from, um, from GCP storage, some stuff for validating secrets, checking that the bucket exists. Uh, and then this F get object gets the object from the provided object storage bucket and writes it to the path. Cool. And then visit object iterates over the object, uh, iterates over the items in the provided object storage bucket, calling visit for every item. If the underlying client or the visit callback returns an error, it returns early. Okay. But what does visit do? Oh, you're, you're, uh, you pass in the visit function. Okay. And then you can close it. And so this is, this is really basic. It's just kind of like a, nice interface to GCP and they have presumably the same interface to all of the other, um, thingamajigs. So we have controller and digest and in, so I'm now in internal predicates, type predicate filters events for a given Helm repository type. Okay. So I'm guessing this is for filtering. And so the predicate is like a filtering predicate rather than something more fascinating. Let's take a look at controller and in controller, we have artifact.go artifact matchers, bucket controller, common test, OCI repository storage.go. Let's take a look at artifact.go. What is this? 40 lines of code. Um, diff returns true. If any of the revisions in the artifact set does not match any of the given artifacts. So we're going to pass it an artifact set and it is itself called from an artifact set. And we're basically going to return, we're going to iterate over everything and return true. If any of the revisions doesn't match. So I guess true means that there is a diff. That's really simple. Helm chart controller, OCI repository, that sweet test. Yeah, there's not really much here.
So let's try looking at something that, that has controller in its title. Here we go. <laughs> 12,000 lines of code. This looks more promising. This might actually be a controller. So we've got some OCI repository ready condition, which has a bunch of conditions that are summarized somehow. I don't know what that means, but this looks like a bunch of stuff that is API stuff that we're kind of like registering. We have an OCI repository reconciler, which has things like a client, an event recorder, some storage, a controller name and patch options. And we have this function OCI repository reconcile func is the function type for all V1 beta two OCI repository sub reconcile functions. The type implementations are grouped and executed serially to perform the complete reconcile of the object. So you're going to pass it in a context, a serial patcher, which I guess is going to patch some stuff an OCI repository an artifact and a directory. And it's going to give you a reconcile result. Okay. And then we've got some setup stuff. And then here's the reconcile function. And it's got a bunch of annotations. I'm not really sure what this stuff is doing. Maybe something about JSON conversion. I don't know. So reconcile is going to take a context and a request and return a result in an error. So first we're going to fetch the OCI repository. Record the suspend status. Uh, I guess this is mainly for metrics. So you can record statistics about your stuff. Um, initialize the patch helper. So we, we've been passed in, I think, a patch helper. And we're going to, I guess, get it or create it. I'm not sure. Um, and then rec result re stores the abstracted, re abstracted reconcile result. So we're going to have this thing just to store the result. Then we're going to defer this function. Always attempt to patch the object and status after each reconciliation. Okay, so we're going to need a new helper, whatever helper is. And we've got these summarize options. And I'm not sure how we're deciding that these are the options we need, but this is looks kind of baked in. Um, and then we're going to call summarize and patch on the context, the object, and these summarize ops we just made. Then we're going to record some metrics. And then we'll examine if the object is under deletion. And if it is, we'll just return. And we're done. And then it says add finalizer first, if not exist, to avoid the race condition between init and delete. Note, finalizers in general can only be added when the deletion timestamp is not set. So we check if it contains a finalizer. And if it doesn't, then we're going to add the finalizer. Then we'll return if the object is suspended. I'm not sure what causes a reconciliation to be suspended, but maybe that's something that you have some control over. Um, if you don't want to, um, sometimes when you're deploying stuff, you want to pause some deployments and maybe that's this sort of thing. And then we'll reconcile the actual object. We just, which we just do by, um, I guess calling the reconcile function that was passed in. Let me return. Didn't I just look at reconcile? Is it just another reconcile? This is capital R reconcile. And here is lowercase r reconcile, which is the thing we call at the end here. And so lowercase r reconcile, which is the internal version, the one that's not exported to other modules or whatever Go calls them. Reconcile, reconcile iterates through the OCI repository reconcile func tasks for the object. So we're just going to iterate over the tasks which were passed in. And all of that looks fine. What does reconcile source do? It fetches the upstream, the upstream OCI artifact metadata and content. All right. So I feel like, I feel like this is uh, the sort of thing I was looking for. At least we have like something that looks like a controller or, or a reconciler and it's pretty straightforward. Um, I guess I don't feel like I need to really dig into to what it's doing. Um, there was something I wanted to look at and let me see if I can find it by just scrolling back up. New object patch. 
I think it was in capital R reconcile. Yeah, I want to see if we can find implementations of this of this reconcile function. Funk. Maybe here. No. That's just the type. So some someone's going to implement it. Who knows who? Not me for sure. But let's take a look at Flux2. Did I miss an internal directory? Yeah, I did. Is this the important directory? Let's look at build.go. Okay, this looks important. So we have this builder struct. Builder builds YAML manifests. It retrieves the customization object from the Kubernetes cluster. The customization object. I don't think the Kubernetes cluster knows about customization objects. I think it knows about things that are built from customization objects. Are they storing like raw objects in the cluster somehow? I'm not sure. And overlays the manifests with the resources specified in the resource path. So we've got a client, a REST mapper, whatever a REST mapper is, some naming stuff, some a path for the resources, a customization file, something about ignore, stuff to ignore, I guess. Um, a sync a, a mutex used to synchronize access to the customization file, an action, a customization action, I guess. So some action that customization is gonna customize is gonna perform. Um, a customization type. So I guess some YAML snippet essentially, timeout, whatever a spinner is, yak spin, is this another, who knows? And then <laughs> whether this is a dry run. I kinda wanna know what yak spin is. Yet another C spin, yet another Cly spinner. Oh, I guess this is just like an animation for, provides yet another Cly spinner in Go, taking inspiration and some utility code from some other spinner project. The most popular, what is a spinner library? Is this like a waiting thing? Yeah, I think that's what this is. Okay, so we're gonna spin. And for some reason, Builder needs, needs a spinner. I guess Builder needs a spinner because they're gonna, it's gonna tell you that it's taking time to build stuff. Um, and we've got some of this width stuff that is um, common in Go. It's gonna set options basically with namespace, with ignore, new builder. New builder returns a new builder. It takes a customization name and path to the resources and a list of builder option funks to configure the builder. So we're gonna, um, resolve customization. What are we building? I'm not really sure. Are we just building customization? I think that's what it said, right? It retrieves customization object. Okay. So it's some, some YAML builder flags. Let's look at CRDs. We have things like CRD policy, contain string items, set and type and description. Okay. Whatever that is. We have RSA key bits. And we can, these are like setters and getters and stuff for RSA key bits. Okay. So nothing so important here, seems like. And we have tree.go, which we looked at. Okay. And so maybe in this directory, everything is really in um, the individual controllers that are in separate repositories. But just for, just for fun, let's look at the image update automation controller and see if there's anything um, fundamentally new here. Well, we got a lot of imports and we've got some size, that's 630 lines. I'll start from the bottom just for fun. So template message renders a message template returning a, the message or an error. So more template rendering. We've got this notion of an event, which is gonna take a context and an image update automation and a severity and a message. It's going to return nothing, I guess. Although it's going to call event recorder. What is an image update automation? Is the schema for the image update automations API. So we've got some type meta, object meta, a spec, which is an image automation update spec, etc. So where is image? This should be like a Kubernetes YAML thing, right? Or, or maybe not. Maybe it's a Go thing. So the image automation spec 
has crossed namespace source reference. So source ref refers to the resource giving access details to a Git repository. So I guess this is a thing that has access details to your Git repo. Then we have a Git spec, which contains all the Git specific definitions. This is technically optional, but in practice mandatory until there are other kinds of source allowed. And then we have a duration that gives the lower bound on how often automation, automation run should be attempted. Is this maybe the stuff that, that pulls continuously? I'm not sure. And then we have an update strategy, how to update the files in the repository. This can be left empty to use the default value using setters, I guess, and suspend tells the controller to not run this automation until it is unset or set to false defaults to false. Okay. So you need to, I guess, set it to true to true, right? Okay. So I don't, I don't have the inclination to download all of these files to look at all the controllers, but at least I have more of a sense now of, um, what flux CD is up to. And what is it up to? It seems a lot simpler, maybe more bare bones than, than Argo. Um, it almost seems like it's not really, <laughs> not really doing anything when you, when you ignore all the code, that's kind of like glue code, but I think maybe that's, maybe that's good. Maybe, um, that, uh, that is a, a significant amount of simplicity. Although the fact that it pulls in a bunch of stuff from other repos makes it kind of a little bit harder to reason about because uh, you know, they can always add more repos and add more stuff to, to pull from. And that wouldn't necessarily be really visible unless you're, um, checking out how, how the files that, that do that stuff are changing. Um, so I guess let's take a look at the components just to make sure we, we haven't missed anything and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. So source controller has the Git repository CRD, the OCI repository CRD, the Helm chart CRD and the bucket CRD. So these are going to be custom resource definitions to let you say things like, this is my, this is my Git repository. I don't know what the customized controller is going to do. The customized controller is a Kubernetes operators specialized in running continuous delivery pipelines for infrastructure and workloads defined with Kubernetes manifest and assembled with customize. So what is it going to do? It reconciles the cluster state from multiple sources provided by source control. So I guess maybe that's the idea. So, um, in your various directories, perhaps you have little customized snippets and instead of you assembling them and like handling, handing them off to flux, maybe flux is going to pull them and do the assembly for you. Perhaps, um, it'll generate manifest with customize from plain Kubernetes YAMLs or customized overlays. It'll decrypt Kubernetes secrets with Mozilla SOPs and KMS. What is Mozilla SOPs? Get SOPs. Secrets operations. It's an editor of encrypted files and supports YAML. Okay. Is this a Mozilla thing? Okay. Some secrets editor validates manifest against Kubernetes API impersonates service accounts. Um, and then it does health assessment of the deployed workloads. Why? I'm not sure why the, the customized controller needs to look at the deployed workloads, unless the workloads are specifically the, the things doing the building. So we have what a customized controller, I guess is going to uh, interact somehow with the source controller. And we've got tenants and each tenant has a namespace. Maybe each tenant has their own namespace. This is maybe for like a multi-tenant Kubernetes deployment. And it's going to use RBAC CRDs and deployments. And it's going to deploy in various places or maybe pull from pool source. Yeah. So the source controller is going to pull stuff from things like GitHub, GitLab and Amazon S3. And the customized controller is the thing that's doing the deploying, which once you assemble the customizes, I guess, essentially just, you've created, <laughs> you have deployment objects. Um, but for some reason, this controller is going to monitor the health. It's also going to run pipelines in a specific order. 
So I guess you can have different um, workloads that depend on other workloads. It'll prune objects removed from source. I'm not sure what this means, but this might mean that if you like accidentally delete things, it'll start deleting them from your actual cluster, which seems like a, a bad idea. I feel like you want something like tombstoning. I'm not sure that that is what it means, but uh, maybe I'll dig into that. It's going to report cluster state changes. Do you have any uh, Flux CD garbage collection? How can I safely move sources from one directory to another to move manifests from a directory synced by a Flux customization to another directory synced by a different customization? First, you need to disable garbage collection. What? I feel like this is a deal breaker for me. Disable garbage collection by setting prune false. No. Can you like permanently disable? Can you per how can I safely rename? If you're, if a flux customization has spec prune set to true and you rename, rename the object then all reconciled workloads will be deleted and recreated. So like, what if you're, I mean, like, what if your workload is, um, has some permanent storage, right? So this, this garbage collection thing is going to, um, be a, a data loss risk. Even if, even if in some cases it's like a small amount of storage, like what if you accidentally delete, um, see somebody pushes something that has a, a Kubernetes secret or something in it. Um, and uh, that causes the secret to be deleted. And then it's difficult to recreate this, the secret. Maybe you have a, hopefully you have a, a backup somewhere. Well, you might, might need to go to a safe. You might need like multiple people to retrieve the secret. Um, but it, you know, you're, you might start to do things like shred, shred data so that you can, you, you can't possibly recover it because uh, you've lost access to your, to your keys. Um, and you can, you know, have all the other sorts of data loss. You can, uh, you can just cause all your customers to have a bad time by like accidentally deleting pods and stuff. So this to me, I think is a, is a big no as far as garbage collection. I don't know if it's possible to turn off garbage collection completely. Let's try. Can you turn off flux CD garbage collection? I don't know. There's nothing really obvious. It seems like they believe in garbage collection and, um, and to disable it, you need a, a prune, a prune thing on every spec, which is just too much work and too much of a, too, too easy to get wrong. So I was feeling like this was a good, simple project that, um, might be useful for me, but I think that Given that it's going to start deleting things, um, if I make a mistake, I think I'm going to pass, um, and maybe the thing we look at tomorrow will be will be it, or maybe I'll um, maybe I'll decide on something else like Prowl, which I think is the the CI system that that the Kubernetes team itself uses for for testing Kubernetes. So I'll stop there. Um, that is Flux CD. If you're interested in the space, also, uh, make sure to look at the Argo CD slash Argo workflows video from yesterday and the Kubernetes video from long ago, which goes over not only the Kubernetes code, but also some background on, on what Kubernetes is doing and where it came from. And it's a, it's a legacy with Borg and all that stuff. And then uh, tomorrow I'm looking at Tekton, which I think might be similar to Flux CD in the sense that it takes a, sim a simplified approach. Um, and we'll see how that looks tomorrow. Thanks for watching.